Get in the cart. Right at us. Four. The best in the business, Roger Cleveland. Can't wait to get back to Chicago in this one. This is Party of Four, a Mistwood Golf Club podcast. And welcome into the Party of Four podcast. I'm Ben Hutchison alongside my regular partner, Director of Golf at Mistwood, podcast extraordinaire Andy Michelson. Good morning. It's good to be back in the saddle. I know it's been a while, but uh, it's been a busy winter. It's been a busy winter and a little bittersweet listening to the intro because a lot of that material is from the PGA show. Yeah. And Roger Cleveland hanging out, you know, your boy. (laughs) <laughs> but it's just I missed it this year it just it's not the same it's not what it used to be they went virtual last year they brought it back this year you were actually down there yeah what'd you think of it so Frank and I made the last minute decision to, to go down there for like basically a day and a half and um really really disappointing you know I I kind of blame uh, Frank and I were talking about this I kind of blame all parties uh involved I don't just solely blame the PGA for um kind of making things unsure of by not having a show last year. Um, in, you know, I, when I say I blame all parties, it, it has to do with, you know, the, the, the companies don't bring out the, the cool new stuff anymore right at the show. That was the coolest part of the show. I mean, up until, I mean, as recently as 2015, 2016, you would go to the show to see, you know, the new this, the new that. Um, heck, even like new clothing lines and stuff. Like we meet right now. We meet with vendors about next fall stuff, like right now, which is crazy to me. Like, there's no, there's no anticipation. There's no fun uh, associated with the show. So, I think all parties need to get together, put their heads together, and figure out how can we bring the excitement back to this thing. Maybe it's not the old traditional uh, expo anymore, where you just walk aisle to aisle to aisle to aisle. Um, maybe it's something more interactive, and I don't even know what that that could be, but I think some smart people and maybe people that are way smarter than me can, can figure this out because it's stale. It's, it's not as fun as it used to be. And, and it's a shame too, because a big part of that show is, is the new vendors and the the people basically trying to make it. I mean, they, they depend greatly on the success of their product based on those three or four days of traffic. So um, I I don't know what it, what happens if it goes to a more regional thing or, or what, but, um, yeah, it was very disappointing. It is interesting because now with the Chicago Auto Show coming up, it'd be like the cars not bringing out their newest model of cars, and there would be no show. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then, then marketing, you know, shame on them, no, <laughs> is trying to outrace each other. I mean, you've got clubs that came out this week from some major manufacturers that they're already teasing back in December. And I understand that they're trying to seed them and put them in guys' bags right away. But save that stuff for the show. If you save that stuff for the show, it, there's there's a huge anticipation. I mean, you're talking about millions of dollars in the past were put around these launch events solely for the PGA show to get then, you know, the heartbeat of the market, which is your um, dealers and your PGA professionals, that's the heartbeat of the market, right? If you get those guys excited about the product right then and there, then they're going to go home and they're going to evangelize and go crazy about it instead of, you know, just the same tired marketing messages every single year. This one's going to get you more distance. This one's more forgiving, all this other stuff, which is great, which is fine. But, you know, if if you're putting your hands on it for the first, it's like it's like having Christmas late, right, for a, for a golf pro. You know, you go there and you, you get to hit it and touch it and feel it yourself for the first time. You come back with that excitement, and you're telling everybody about how cool that stuff is. I mean, it's just so different from what it was. Me working in marketing, and we've obviously learned a lot and pulled a lot from our friends at Callaway in the last couple of years, and I enjoyed talking with them and our friend Harry at the show. But one thing that's really frustrating for me to see from this angle is that we've talked about there's so much excitement around the game of golf, the growth of the sport, getting the youth involved, and then you have your big moment for the golf industry, more professionals and uh, different small businesses and those people trying to throw their items out there, and whether it's technology or uh, training aids, just for more people to see, and that kind of just falls flat. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I went to the show back during, quote-unquote, the recession, and it was insane. 
It was absolutely insane. Everyone trying to outdo each other and go the extra mile. Right now, we are in, we're getting flooded as far as golf goes. And you go down there, and it couldn't be a, a bigger dichotomy of what's actually going on in the golf market. It's, it's depressing. It's slow. It was, it was crazy. I mean, honestly, we spent a day in there, and I've spent three and four days like solid in there. And I spent a day in there and went, okay, I think we've seen everything. We saw a few things that we wanted to see. We we're disappointed on the things that we went down there to try to see that we didn't see. Um, but yeah, it was it was just so so disappointing to see because it's, it's such a difference between what's actually going on in the golf market and what they're producing. And hopefully, like you said, some heads get together and people start to talk. And if there is that overriding message, the things change and we can bring back the excitement. But let's move more locally now to Mistwood Golf Dome. We are back in the middle of winter, the thick of winter. Now that we've had our big snow, it feels like winter. Uh, but good things over there. And we have a big event coming up this weekend that's already sold out. Yep, going old school at the old course. Uh, it's an event that we uh, did back in... 2020 it was like right before the right before the pandemic i think it was our last event uh before uh everything shut down um yeah it's 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 gonna be a blast sold out real quick uh 30 teams 30 bays uh we have uh, sam adams on as our uh, beer supplier so a lot of fun there um you know just like our other events 18 hole event team event um partnering with a, a beer distributor like this we're able to you know, serve beer to the stations uh, as complimentary by Sam Adams every, you know, 20, 30 minutes. You're always sampling something new and different. It's a good opportunity for us, good opportunity for them. So uh, it's a, just a good partnership every single event to do something different and new. And we talked about some of the physical changes to the Dome this year, but then you also added a whole other section on one end to help with teaching. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of been an issue the last last few years is, you know, not to sound like a greedy capitalist, but you look at things from a, a teaching standpoint of, of what we're utilizing as far as, as bays and bay time and, you know, where we needed more space. And, and frankly, the game's expanding in the in the teaching and club fitting side, so we needed to, to make some changes. So um, just basically kind of put up a very simple, um, you know, net apparatus with, with matting and everything else just, just to give that, that extra space for our teachers invested in some uh, foresight devices, uh, some GC threes to, to, you know, make sure the technology is, is at par or better uh, with what they're getting in the station. So um, that seemed to help out. It's helped a lot with juniors. Um, we've been able to have entertain larger junior classes more often. Uh, so those, those um, have expanded as well, but uh, yeah, just a lot of different changes. And, and again, we're always looking to, to push the envelope there. I'm sure there's going to be something new next year. Um, you know, we're talking about maybe trying to find some more simulator options, maybe within the property, uh, maybe in the old OTB space, just things like that. But, um, you know, we're always talking and thinking about what's what's next. So if you haven't been over there, make sure to get a reservation, www.misswoodgolfdome.com slash hours. You can find all of that. Let's move over you, to... You still have to do the www? I don't know. I mean, sometimes it pops up. Okay. I think mistodome.com is probably good. Enough. I mean, that's probably fine, too. Okay. But, you know, if you're working on that W finger, you'll be all right. <laughs> but let's move to the uh, Pebble Beach AT&T Pro-Am. That was interesting. First, let's talk about the winner. We'll talk about Jordan Spieth here in yeah. a second. But Tom Hoagie, who, uh, for someone like me, not really huge on my radar, not on a lot of people's radar, but... Gets his first PGA Tour win, and what, he's 32, I believe? Uh, yeah, 31 or 32. I uh, looked up some of his stats. Uh, I don't think he's ever played the Masters. I PGA Championship tied for 58th in 2020. U.S. Open tied for 43rd in 2019. And I don't think he's played the Open Championship. So <laughs> this is what we're working with here. He played in a... Uh, final group of Tiger, I guess, in the 2015 uh, Canadian Open. That's a fun fact. Anyway, um, yeah, just what a great story of, of perseverance. I mean, 30 years old, it was funny. His quote was at the end of the tournament that he forgot how to celebrate because he hasn't won in so long. And you forget <laughs> that. Like, when you're coming up, like, the junior ranks and you're the best in your area, um, you know, you win quite often, right? And so you, you know, you know what that feels like, and you know the the pressures and things like that. But the the dude probably hasn't won in what 
10 plus years at anything, it sounds like. He won the 2011 Canadian Tour Players Cup. Ooh. <laughs> he's done the web.com and the Canadian Tour. Those are two of the ones he's uh, been on. And right. it was the 2015 Wyndham Championship. He had the 36 hole lead after with Tiger Woods. Oh, okay. At the so time. It so. Sorry. so it wasn't the Canadian Open. I thought it was the Canadian Open. Anyway, I knew he played in the Canadian Tour. Anyway, but yeah, that's that's 11 years since the last time he's won. And, and, what a story, not giving up and perseverance and just just amazing. But what's cool about that and what I always love about golf and what irritates the hell out of, like, my father-in-law who watches golf, well, where's where's this guy on the leaderboard? Where's that guy on the leaderboard? Like, I love watching the next new story. What's the next new story? What's the, what's the next guy that can catch fire? You know, maybe he rips off another top five at, at the uh, waste management and so on and so on and so on. I love that stuff. I, kn- I know the casual golf fan doesn't, but I love seeing a much more um, diver- diverse leaderboard week to week as far as um, kind of their backgrounds and where they're coming from. It's fun to watch Rory at his best. It's fun to watch DJ at their best. It's fun to watch Justin Thomas at their best. But it's kind of cool every once in a while to see guys, you know, break through and persevere. Honestly, watching the tournament – so I had to unfortunately go see Sing too with my family. So I had to leave at on the fourteenth hole. Quick review of the movie though. Awful. Really? Well, I mean, is it good for the kids? Maybe for the kids it was okay. Okay. But, I mean, that's all that matters, I think. So I had to leave on the fourteenth hole, but I knew I was coming back and I was going to watch it. And so I I didn't didn't purposely watch it, but I left on the fourteenth hole. Jordan Spieth was leading by two. Game over. Game over. Done deal. No no problem at all. And then Hoagie comes through and he birdies the last. Three out of five to win it and win it, wins it with a par on eighteen. That's uh, that's pretty special stuff. What what a lot of people don't don't realize too when you're standing on that eighteenth tee. And I've been fortunate enough to have to birdie it twice to to try and win a tournament. I birdied it once and won a tournament once. But <laughs> you stand on that tee, and left is literally it's toast. But right. Actually, just a touch right with the wrong wind, you can send that thing out of bounds. It's amazing. You never see a shot go out of bounds there. But that fairway effectively, because both in length and the angle, is 25, 30 yards wide. It's absolutely amazing how many guys hit that fairway. Effectively, it's like basically 30 yards wide. (laughs) And guys just stripe it down there. Very rarely do you see a ball go in that water. It's just absolutely amazing. And you look at the earnings with the purse this week, and – Hoagie takes home roughly $1.6 million. That wow. $1.6 million, and they asked him after, you know, what does this mean for you and your family and your life? But then Spieth in second, he brings home like $950,000, which doesn't even seem like that much to Jordan Spieth at this point with all the success he's had. So the Hostler <laughs> three wiggle, so Hostler three putted the last hole and left it like high side from like three and a half feet, but he missed it. Nance was right on the call. He goes, that putt was worth $197,000. Yeah, he brought home $600,000. Oh. Like, oh, that has to <laughs> hurt so bad. No, it, it does. Got, a guy like Hostler, who is, he's in that, um, uh, what's the status called? We're 125 to 150. He's in that conditional status. Uh, every single dollar matters. So if he makes that putt, he's probably good to go for the rest of the year. But because he missed it, now he's got to fight for that extra few hundred thousand. And Troy Merritt was leading at one point, I believe, too, in this tournament. And, yeah, you just see these names that you really don't see at the top or they are in that in-between status. And you got a name like Jordan Spieth up there where, I mean, for Tom Hoagie, it might as well have been Tiger Woods right behind him. Yeah. Comparatively. So Merritt, as he was coming in, was just leaving the ball kind of in the wrong spot. Pebble Beach is actually not – an incredibly difficult golf course if you play it from underneath the hole. But if you play it off of the beaten path, like from the sides and come into those greens from the sides and not straight on from the fairway, it's one of the hardest golf courses you'll ever play. And that's what's amazing about it is because if you keep everything under the hole and, and, and basically straight forward right in front of you, it's not that difficult of a golf course. And you saw that with, with Merritt as he got kind of off, off his way a little bit, like 16, for instance, I mean, he, he made a nice par, but when you're on the right on 16, that green slopes right to left, you get the wind going right to left. Like he had everything kind of working against him. If he would have hit a good tee shot there, he could actually attack the pin and, and 
trying to make birdie. But Pebble Beach is all about kind of where you're positioned. It's not going to kill you lengthwise, but positioning wise, it it's where it shows its teeth. Well, I look forward to playing it someday. So let's make that happen. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Jordan Spieth. You have an issue with heights, not oh just God. heights, but when there's nothing underneath you. I can't. Yep. I can't sit upper deck at uh, U.S. Cellular. That scares the hell out of me. Anything. Um, yeah, I, I can do a roller coaster, but the track has to be underneath me. I can't have can't have the track above me. That freaks me out. Uh, you yeah. can't have the legs dangling. Oh no 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 no. Okay. No. No, I've, I have this weird like. I don't know if it's like a vertigo thing, but like when I went to the Grand Canyon, I remember standing like thirty feet from the edge, and feeling like it was pulling me in. Like there was this gravitational pull, like pulling me over the edge. <laughs> I get like really weird, and like the most wussy mountain. Like last year we went to uh, we went to Gatlinburg, <laughs> and it's just these these wussy little hills, but. Like, people are taking selfies, like, next to the edge and stuff like that. I'm literally gripping the wall, like, walking all the way down. I got halfway up and walked all the way down. It's a wussy little mountain. I I cannot do heights at all. So to, so to see what Jordan Spieth did just kind of blows my mind. I had a ball. Here, let's go. Let's just hop right in. Pebble Beach. I've had balls on the right side of six that I could have played that I've taken a drop from just because of that fact. I get so squeamish. Next to, next to the edges of, of just knowing there's a drop off oh. somewhere. Yeah, I feel like it's like pulling me in. Like somebody's like really tugging at my shirt and wanting to throw me in. So you're anti glass floor oh. display. Oh. That's like the dumbest thing ever. Sears Tower. Why, you wouldn't why go up would there. Why would anyone do that? No. Do why, that. Why? Look down. Why? Why? Gatlinburg. You didn't like that glass bridge. No. I. Oh, I didn't even. So. Did your family go on it? Uh, they did, and even it, it freaked them out, and they're not. They're not really big on heights. So that that thing on Gatlinburg, I went up this the ski slope thing or whatever. What do you call it? The gondola? Yeah, I mean, they got like, the, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, the little transport the chairs. Thing. Yeah. So I get all the way to the top, and I am in complete panic. My feet were numb. When I hit the ground, I actually fell over because my feet were numb because I was, like, gripping so hard onto the, onto the ride going up, and that's going up. So then when we got to the top, I'm like, I, I, I can't even go down. So I found a road that was behind that and walked over two miles all the way down to the bottom. Jeez, it's That's, real for you. Yeah, it's, oh, it's almost super like real. an intervention. Super real, yeah. So you, do you not ski? Would you not do chairlifts where you I dangle like, your legs off the edge? I like skiing. The worst part of skiing is chairlift. Yeah. For sure, yeah. I mean, I've only skied twice, but I've done that. And uh, So, yeah, 68 feet straight down for Jordan Spieth, a couple feet away. Obviously, he's pretty good with his balance and his swing and stuff, but... That wasn't a couple feet away. It was like... It was probably probably a foot, A. B, the second half of that fairway goes straight down towards the water. So he's on a downslope. He's a foot away, swinging, which takes your momentum forward as it is. That's the scary part. Oh, oh. So Michael, Michael Greller's caddy said that he was so, like, shaken by the event that he literally couldn't do an interview about it that afternoon or the next morning because he was still, like, physically shaken about it, couldn't sleep that night. I guess Jordan's dad or parents or something confronted him after round, like, that was the dumbest thing you've ever done uh, type thing. Didn't really understand the gravity of the moment until, like, after the after the round was over, which I guess good for him that he's that focused. But, dude, take the drop <laughs> on the green. Take your chance. I mean, you're you're one of the best putters ever. Just maybe make a putt for a four. It just didn't matter at that point to to put your life in your hands like that. It was just insane. Well, I think for the caddy, he also looks at Jordan Spieth like the longer he's around, it's my meal ticket. The, the longer right. I'll have some retirement funds kicking in. Right later on, so uh, totally understandable. Let's move over to the Saudi tournament they had. Uh, that's where a lot of the other. Pros were. I guess it's the equivalent. They consider it like the Players' Championship over there. But so many pros going over there raising the question of appearance fees. Where are you at on that type of thing? They've been doing that forever. They've been doing appearance fees forever on the European Tour. Yes, why is this being blown up right now, though? I think it's the whole politicalization of Saudi Arabia right now, I think, more than anything else. Plus, they're trying to do the Saudi World Tour, so, you know, the 
the PJ Tour is running as much negative press as they possibly can against the, uh, the Saudi Arabian uh, backed tour. I, I don't know. I, I don't have a problem with it. I, I really don't. They, it's been been happening for years. They you know like the all the tournaments in the UAE like Dubai and Abu Dhabi. They've been paying top talent, and those guys haven't played at Torrey Pines, and those guys haven't played at at, at uh, Pebble Beach in the past. And sometimes those guys don't. I remember they used to run the waste management against the Dubai tournament, but I think that's now been changed. So you get top guys that would would stay over there for a few weeks and and make their appearance fees, and it's kind of messed up because the appearance fees are usually a heck of a lot more than the actual winning check. Um, I know this week that they're basically paying guys a couple million dollars to to be over there when the winning check was a million. Um, but I'll tell you what, man, golfers golfers deserve everything they get. They can't have an off day. If they have an off day, they don't they don't earn a check. It's is it the only? I, I can't think of another sport offhand that if you are not playing your best, you're not making money. You can really be bad at baseball and still make your whatever deal for the five years. You can have an off day in football. You could be injured in football and get paid. You can be injured and get paid. That's insane. Does that happen on the PG Tour? No, not at all. So whatever these guys can get, when they can get it, Nick Felder used to talk about it all the time. Guys have a 10-year earning window, and you look at the best of the best of all time, and even Tiger kind of falls in this category. Tiger, you could possibly say maybe it was 12 years. But from 97 to 08, 09 for Tiger was when he amassed all of his all of his money for the most part. Nick Faldo, same thing. Greg Norman, same thing. When you look at all these guys, that's why it was so amazing about Jack Nicklaus is he, he spanned his career far longer than that. But most guys have about a good 10-year window when they're they're playing their best golf of their life. As far as the Super Golf Tour or whatever they want, the Super G Tour, whatever they want to call it, um, you've had guys like Rory and Spieth and Tiger and Rom, I think kind of have some doubts with it. But you have people like Phil, and it's been raised in a number of articles and conversations, or you know, guys like Lee Westwood, who if they could get some sort of contract to guarantee money over there, that's a great thing at 45 to 55 years old. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for, for those players, it's it's got to ring a little bit different. You know, Phil, <clears throat> Phil said in an interview – um, about this whole thing that the only thing he's got left is to win the U.S. Open in his life. So kind of the rest of it is just gravy, right? I think he said he'd retire if he did. Yeah, he would retire if he won the U.S. Open. So the rest of it's gravy. Um, Phil has, Phil's got a point. He's he's kind of been taken advantage of a little bit over the years, but he's also benefited from golf greater than he could ever repay, right? So, you know, Phil's been the face of the PGA Tour or Tiger's been the face of the PGA Tour, like, all they're advertising is tiger fist pumping or something like that here and there. It's like those guys don't get paid for all of those. It's not like the college football with NIL and all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. They're not getting paid for every single exposure that the PGA Tour is getting using their likeness. And there's there's definitely a lot of money that even could even go even more to the players that that's not. And that, that's all Phil's point was was – you're seeing a lot bigger expansion of, of profit sharing and and media rights sharing with the with the players and, and that's not trickling all the way down to the PJ Tour. But at the same point, on the other side, the, the PJ Tour is, is truly the only thing that's where you're like an in, independent contractor. It's a tour, but it's not a tour that owns any players. And from their perspective, they don't owe the players anything. But from the players' perspective, you use their likeness, their play, their everything in order to create the excitement for what the PGA Tour is. So I do see both sides, but I think this might be a healthy next step. And if you want to retain great players on the PGA Tour forever, maybe start opening up the coffers a little bit. Who has the power, the PGA Tour or the players? Oh, the players, 100%. So if... I literally think all this comes down to is the majors. Like the PJ Tour holds the power of the majors. If there is some way to basically detach that from the stigma of being the greatest ever at, at, at the game of golf, then the PJ Tour would really have kind of no chance. The FedEx Cup's great, but 
they could just keep raising the purse in the FedEx Cup. I don't know if that changes a whole heck of a lot, but um, the fact that the majors kind of sit in those four professional events and not not even like the USAM or anything like that anymore is the reason that still the U.S. game is the most attractive. No, and Phil, I mean, kind of mentioned too as well that he does just want some of those opportunities for his own media. It's his own marketing. I mean, Phil's become kind of a marketing machine in the last couple of years specifically. He's opened up. He showed his brand, his personality, the fireside stuff, and it's been fun for people. As far as exposure and everything like that, we've talked about it in the past, but so if if I go on, I was going to say, if I go on Twitter and it's like I – you know, I have share a video of the PGA Tour. Or someone might have taken the video off the TV, you know, put it on Twitter. The PGA will go after and be like, hey, that's our property. I think the NFL used to do it a lot, but I don't see it as much anymore. But it's like you share, that's more eyeballs. More eyeballs can lead to more growth. You're not getting paid for that, but down the road you might. Yes. Yeah, so kind of to further your point and further my point as well is, Phil could share something on Twitter, right, that, that makes that person change their mind about watching the PJ Tour coverage that day. So then the PJ Tour makes more money because there's more eyeballs on it, so they make more money from advertising. But in Phil's perspective, well, the purse is already set. The kind of where, where does that fall in for, for me if I'm creating this buzz around a tour that I don't have any ownership of? I don't know. It's true. No, he wants his little tip on the end of it, yeah. which is fine. He said he had to pay a million dollars for the match to use that material. He had to pay the tour a million dollars. Get out. We have a quote from Phil. If I can bring it up real quick. For me personally, it's not enough that they're sitting on hundreds of millions of digital moments. They also have access to my shots, access I do not have. They also charge companies to use shots I have hit. And when I did the match, there have been five of them. The tour forced me to pay them $1 million each time. (laughs) For my own media rights, the type of greed is, to me, beyond obnoxious. Okay, I get it now. Yeah. (laughs) See? Wow. And people take that and they're like, well, Phil's being greedy because he's going over to Saudi, like, you know, playing in that. But at the same point, he's it's the self-worth is what I think Phil is after. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of comes back to the capitalism argument, right? If Phil makes more money, everybody around him makes more money. And and even the people that serve him make more money. Like, it's okay for him to get richer because he spreads the wealth even more. That's just Phil. And good for him. He's 51 on a tour where, like you said, there's a 10-year window, 20 to 30, you might get a couple and, wins. <laughs> and he's still top three guys of what everyone wants to watch. I was going to say for just wanting to see him play or drawing people or, hey, I'm going to run around, try to get the whole four so I can see Phil walk by me real quick. Yeah, top three. Yeah, easy. All right, well, let's uh, circle back real quick to talk a little bit more equipment. We have a lot of new equipment at the Dome right now. Mm-hmm. Fittings are going crazy. You should probably book one if you want because we're about, what, two weeks out right now? Yeah, I, I haven't seen demand like this this early in the season ever. Uh, I guess it's in line with, with everything that's happening in golf. But, um, yeah, the, the product pool is as good as it's ever been. The technology is as good as it's ever been. Uh, it's good to see some companies taking chances. Uh, I didn't see, think I'd see a carbon back in the head, on the face especially. Um, so that's cool that they're taking chances. What that does is it just pushes the entire market forward. You know, Callaway did the whole jailbreak thing a few years ago, and people were like, does that really work where you attach the crown to the bottom? Is that a big thing? And it was a big thing. And then now, and then TaylorMade had what the inverted cone. This is like 15 plus years ago. And that, that seemed to create more ball speed out of the middle of the face, across the face. And then, then you had the M1. Then you had this jailbreak. Then you have now a carbon face with, with TaylorMade. They had the twist face. They had the twist face. Um, the uh, AI faces that Callaway's had. And then, Titleist goes, well, hey, don't forget about us. And they're actually <laughs> producing some pretty good numbers as far as, you know, guys on tour playing it. What, what always, what most people in the golf industry look at is not the guys necessarily that are getting paid by these companies. It's the guys that are choosing not to be paid and what they're putting in their bags. And uh, that's it's usually a pretty, pretty good fight. Well, we have all that, like I said, over at the Dome, the new Callaway Rogue ST line. 
tailor made stealth as well. I saw the new Mizuno Pro irons over there. Yep, we'll start to see the Cobra stuff come in here. Um, yeah, the Mizuno stuff's kind of cool. They went back to kind of a more classic. It is classic look, shape, design. Um, yeah, they they seem to always win the, the looks category uh, as far as irons go. But uh, it's it's just cool to see. A uh, little renaissance of look, but also build some tech in there. And one last marketing bit before we go. We're going to get our summer programs ready. We're going to need people to sign up for those early. Yep, yep. We, uh, we're we getting we're getting going on uh, sooner, than, sooner than we ever have. We're going to have uh, all our junior uh, lesson information, all of our junior clinics coming out here in the next, uh, next week or two. So uh, look for that and um, look for a, a big, busy summer out here. All right. We'll be back here in a couple weeks. Look forward to sitting down with you again. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next time. Get in the cart. Right at us. The best in the business, Roger Cleveland. Can't wait to get back to Chicago in this one. This is Party of Four, a Mistwood Golf Club podcast.